Awesome. Well, Perry Ackman nailed it, right? Turkish. Yeah. Yeah. The Turkish wonder. Yeah. Like, there was no like premature ejecting from the society. It's it's wonderful. Do more of that online. Thanks for joining me. I like your headphones. Thank you. Are those they're wireless? Um, I don't. I think they're like they're Sony. Sony. Yeah. yeah. I can't oh, afford nice. these. <laughs> oh, headphones are so expensive. They are, but I can't stand earbuds. I know. Well, it's like, how much do you want to pay to have your eardrums exploded? Yeah, and they don't fit in my ear. And like this way, I get like complete isolation, and everyone knows that I'm wearing them. That's right. So they don't bother you. Yeah. Cause you, cause you, you write when you're writing, you go to like a, um, a mall where there's tons of people and write. Am I, am I correct? Uh, no, I actually do most of my writing at home. <laughs> okay. Um, so you're not in very crowded areas, gotcha. <laughs> no, but I still like the isolation. There's outside noise. Sometimes my husband's off doing stuff. Um, even I have, I have ADD, so even like a little bit of noise can like really distract me. So I need like that kind of all-consuming distraction. I totally get it. I totally get it. Like having multiple screens up at once. I I don't know how I get anything done, honestly. Like <laughs> if I'm not totally obsessed with something, one thing, then yeah, you gotta get into the zone. Like, yeah. So you you're the author yes. of Warlocks of Sigil. I you didn't even let me finish before you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are an author. That's correct. You are the author. I take this very serious, Perry, of Warlocks of the Sigil (laughs) and Heroes of the Sigil. Tell me. I know what a warlock is. It's an evil wizard. Um, Right? Do you have a different definition? Well, I wanted to use a term that wasn't used in a lot of media, so I kind of picked warlocks on a whim. Because, you know, witch, wizard, mage, they all had, like, pretty common uses. But then when I learned what warlock meant, it worked really well. And warlock had a very uh, masculine, like, military-based, like, definition, where it was very combat, like, decide, like uh, defined. And that worked really well because the warlocks in my world, which are just magic users, um, you know, they are primarily seen as, like, workers. Like, you, if you have a magical ability, you're going to be using that magical ability for a job that you might not get a choice in. Uh, there's like a lot of, and that means there's a lot of them in the military, for example. Okay. So it worked out pretty well, but the evil definition also works. Yeah, because I, I I googled it <laughs> for because I have a warlock in one of my stories, and I was yeah. like, I didn't want to be um, what's the word called, uh, redundant and say an evil warlock when the word warlock like in the definition was like a dark wizard or something something like yeah. that. But you, and your your definition or another definition of it is military esque fighting magical yeah. human. Yeah. Or like witches you kind of assume they live in swamps and like do their own thing. Wizards are off in their towers, but warlocks are kind of on the ground doing stuff. They're like sold okay, I got you. Yeah, they're like soldiers. Yeah. It makes sense. I do think of I do think of witches just with like warts on their nose and and I I, n- I never liked the idea of uh, wizards flying on brooms for some reason. I always thought that was such a, a witch thing to do. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a lot of different archetypes of different magic things, and they all exist separately, and then they kind of got fused together thanks to tabletops, like bringing all the archetypes together. Yeah. Like, the term druid has a completely different meaning than what we associate with it. It's kind of fascinating. And druid is a magical type as well. Yeah, but initially, druid just basically meant, like, a renaissance man for, like... Right. Like, I think in Ireland, like, they, but then, like, Neo Druidism popped up, and then obviously a Dungeons and Dragons. And so the term kind of changed to be like a nature based magic user. Right. So, what is, so what's Warlocks of Sigil, of the Sigil, uh, about? Um, so, like, straightforward or like my, how, what I think it's about, because I feel like those are two different things. It's like I could talk about how I would pitch it to someone who wants to read it, and then I would talk about it as a writer, what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 all right let me hear your pitch for it to tell somebody who wants to read it and then we'll go into what it's what it means to you i will warn you i'm very bad at pitching uh, Good. 
That's okay. Uh, yeah. Practice makes basically, perfect. Basically, it's about a 15-year-old boy named Quinn. He's a ward of a magic academy, which basically means that he uh, will have the affinity for some sort of magical ability when he grows up. He want, And he needs a teacher, so right. he like a, a warlock master. And he ends up getting someone who is very strange and mysterious. She's wrapped entirely in bandages and walks with a limp and seems to have, uh, you know, an agenda to her. And basically, their first meeting, she's like, you know, nothing can stop me from just killing you right here. Just saying. And he decides to go with her, despite all reason. That's what I'm looking for. (laughs) And the story is largely about him and her uh, kind of going on adventures. You know, there's gods, uh, there's there's banter, there's uh, demons and monsters. And, you know, that's basically it. It's I I wanted to start with a very simple premise for my first story. And that's what I went with. yeah. Simple. Yes. So <laughs> very simple. What? So the lady's dressed up like a mummy, pretty much. Yeah, basically. She but she's she not a mummy. Skin, no, she says she has a skin disease, so she has to like make sure no one like touches her. Do you ever talk about what the skin disease is? Yeah, that's a plot point, actually. It is. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> is it make her extra magical? It might. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, it sounds, that sounds cool. So we're, we're, the, the character's name is Quint? Yeah, Quinn. Q-U-I-N-N. Quinn. Okay, and we're going on a journey with him to discover his magical abilities. Yeah. And I take it he runs into some things along the way. <laughs> yeah, he runs into things. It's a very coming-of-age story. It's why, you know, it's why you get that whole thing where he grows up, he learns. He has yeah. flaws at the beginning, and then at the end he, like, shows that he's moving past them. It's beautiful. It's the I love the hero's journey. It's so fantastic because in and it can be done in so many different ways and in so many different worlds. How what's your world like? Did you build a whole new world? Are you I wanted to do a very freeform world where I just kind of wanted to vomit words on the page and see what came of it. And I had a very clear world, world in my head that I realized not a lot of people understood uh which I had to rectify in the sequel. But uh basically I wanted a world that wasn't modern but not completely medieval either uh so it was a very like uneven world because you had magic but you know there's no electricity so everyone uses carriages but fine made goods can exist because magic can create them so i kind of wanted a world that was very similar to ours with very similar rhetoric very similar dialect but very clearly wasn't Mm. uh someone kind of compared it to the anime full metal alchemist which uh is a bit more like technology technologically advanced than what my story is but the idea of like it's kind of like our world but not all the way there because of how magic works uh really kind of fit that tone so there's a lot of similarities but not the same. yeah not quite you know have you ever thought about this with magic like we always we always paint magic in the in the past um yeah. like it was something that was it was something that had left us but do you ever think of it like it's something that we're coming to as a as a species and we've all been like, we know it's inside of us and we're starting to figure it out somehow. But it, it could also be like within technology and the way we're going to be fusing humans with technology or like even just a spiritual awakening of some sort to untapped potential in the human ability. I think that, so magic, I see is like a giant metaphor. So really what you do with magic kind of says what you want to do with the story. So in that sense, like in that version you're talking, you're talking about like a very transhumanist approach of like, where are we going? Right. What is going to happen? What will this mean for us? And you see it in a lot of sci-fi, which I think is unfortunate because sci-fi usually doesn't use magic. They kind of have, they might have some weird undefined like, like a plot device, but it's very rarely magic. So I, I personally think that a lot of stories would benefit from being able to just use magic in their story to really explore those concepts. Um, currently, I am not exploring that concept, but I do have a few more modern fantasy stories because I think we need more of those. I agree. I think the, the the idea of it being in the past has been done quite a bit, and I think it's just a cool idea. I mean, when you think, I don't know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyway, so what does this story mean to you? Now that you gave us your <sighs> page, what is the so, story to you? I wanted to be a writer since I was like 11, you know, and I was writing before that. And I had this huge idea in my head that I started writing when I was like 14 and it meant so much to me. And I knew this is what I wanted to write and I couldn't make it work. It was like my baby. And I went to college. I joined like a gaming group and I started writing a bunch of stuff on the side for that game world. And I, and at some point it was reaching the point where I was writing 40,000 words in a week, just out of like passion. And I was like, why am I stuck on this 
magnum opus that I have, what I could, I could just write anything. I could literally just write a story and forget about being good, forget about like being unique. I just want to write something that makes me happy and is indulgent and takes all of the emotions I love. And I sat down and I wrote the first chapter of this book and I had no idea where it was going, which became more or of the sigil. And I finished that book in like a month. It was like the seeds had opened up. I wrote 100,000 words in a month. <laughs> Take that, wow. NaNoWriMo. And it was just <laughs> every cliche, every cliche, every trope in Yahweh that I loved and I despised fused together into something that made me happy. Yeah. And that is kind of where the story is coming from for me, which is everything like, you know, was about growing up and trauma and the fact that I wanted more characters and why I just kind of talk and argue about stuff. I didn't want a world to be so clearly defined. I wanted there to be some ambiguity baked into how the characters viewed things. Yeah. Um, I wanted the character to be a fan of fantasy novels in a fantasy story. So I wanted to create a world where what that would look like. Um, and then have arguments about the fantasy novel, because that is what I would do. I have arguments about fantasy novels all the time. I want to see the characters having that. That's fantastic. That's yeah. so, and I've talked about this before, writing something that you are, like, dying to read. Yeah. Why? I mean, that's, like, I feel like that's the best thing we can do as writers, because you're not, like, you're not, like, some weirdo who's the only one who's interested in this. I mean, no, you may I feel like it sometimes, there. but there's a ton of people who feel like that. Like, they want to read that exact same story yeah which is really cool yeah did it turn out being exactly what you wanted it to be yeah you know i, I haven't been able to recreate that magic specifically <laughs> magic uh but you know like i had an idea in my head it kind of just formulated out i wrote it and it just kind of became exactly what i thought it would be and mm -hmm. that was the book and then i put it aside for a bit and then like ideas started coming for the second book and the third book and those have given me no shortage of trouble because it turns out I like being artsy. Uh, it's fun. But the first book was basically exactly what I expected it to be. Like it okay. turned out how I wanted it to. Um, I have some regrets now that I've published it and I've gone through like criticism processes, but like they're all very minor issues. They're all things that I would have never known if I, like if I had just edited it forever, I had to have gone through the process to learn. So. Yeah. So, so when did you publish uh, Warlocks of the Sigil? In July, about two years ago. Okay. Yeah. And it uh, took you. It took you a month to write. Yeah, and, and then. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, it took me a month to write, and then I didn't know what to do next. Like I knew I had to edit it before I could start querying. I ended up independently publishing later, but I, at the time I wanted to be self uh, traditionally published. Sure. But I didn't know how to do that, and I I've mentioned that I have ADD, so. I can write. I can write forever. Put me in a room and I will write. But do not ask me to do anything else because uh, the executive dysfunction will kick in. So I just kind of stopped writing. and I was The so executive dysfunction. Writing. I like that. Yeah, it basically, it's that, say that voice is like, you should do the dishes. And you're like, yeah, I should do the dishes. And then you sit and do nothing. Yep. And you just get stuck I'm, in that loop. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that was job applications for me all the way. Like, I just could not. And querying is basically job applications. Like, you are just giving your resume out, and I can't do it. I, I, um, but basically, I just put it aside, and instead of editing it or trying to write, like, r letters, I just wrote the second book. <laughs> you were like, forget this crap. <laughs> yeah, I wrote another 100,000 words because wow. I was procrastinating. And then yeah. I didn't really do much. Life got in the way. I wrote a few things here and there. And then out of the blue, my friend messaged me he's like, hey, I know you're writing. Do you want to do something together? And I was like, I have these two books that I'm never going to edit. And I have a friend offering to edit. I should just self-publish. And so there was like a two-year gap between writing the book and actually publishing it just based on like other stuff I did. But that's more or less like how the timeline worked out. I assume that was your question. If not, I'm yeah. going to. No, you totally nailed it. <laughs> hey. that, was, that was fantastic. That's so cool. So what were some of the um, the issues you ran into when you said, like, because the first feedback we get on a, our first published book is terrifying, of course. And I remember feeling like I wanted everyone to read it, but I didn't want anybody to read it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh yeah. No, I, I definitely get that. People will be like, hey, I'm reading your story. And I'm like, yay. Please tell me you love it. And if not, never speak to me again. Yeah. Uh, just let me run away. Well, the initial feedback I got was pretty positive. I had a lot of friends who were already into the idea. Uh, then Amazon removed a bunch of reviews from my friends because uh, some of them mentioned like stuff like, oh, I got an advanced review copy. And I don't know if that's always allowed. It was just a mess. 
Um, I, I think I also had an extensive thank like thanking list. So some of their names popped up in the Amazon reviews because uh, they did my beta readers. And I think that also got them deleted. I'm not too sure on the specifics, but I lost at least like five or six reviews, which sucks. Um, most that of them were positive. Finicky. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are really positive. Uh, then I started getting some less positive ones as I started reaching other people outside of my social group. Um, like I wrote, I wrote my book with a lot of uh, LGBTQ themes, but I didn't advertise that because I didn't think they were major themes. I thought it was just kind of like one of those undercurrents of, yeah, this is the world. There's a lot of different people in this world. This is one right. type of person. It was like the real world, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I went to a liberal college. I went to, I have a bunch of hippie friends. Like a lot of us are in those categories. So it was me just reflecting life. And so I would get people being like, you know, this book is good, but there's a mistake in it. They keep using they as if it were singular. And that's because I was using singular they for like non-binary characters. Uh, uh, someone else was like, oh, the book would be good if it didn't have all the Tumblr shit in it. In it. So, you know, stuff like that. Um, it was also interesting because uh, I based my magic system off of a very like superhero anime-esque vibe where like, I basically argue it's more of like a superhero system where everyone has a unique thing and maybe they don't always like make sense with to each other, but they're always internally consistent because that's the type of stuff I like. Okay. Like, you know, Spider-Man has, has a web slinging and Superman and well, Superman's in a different universe, but uh, Scarlet Witch has magic. Uh, and those two characters don't really make much sense together, but they still exist. And we understand that logically they like have similar stuff going on. Right. Sort of. They're, I'm not going to get into a comic book today, but the point is we understand that yeah. superheroes. <laughs> and so I get things like the magic system is so unrealistic. And I was like, how is magic supposed what? to be realistic? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, what the crap? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I got some reviews like that. And I realized it was interesting because people who are used to like X-Men or like uh, Japanese comic books, they got it right away. They knew what was up. But people I think more used to like Game of Thrones or Brandon Sanderson were like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I don't like it. It just that didn't make sense to me. Yeah, and I'm, I, you know, I read manga growing up. That's where I got a lot of my fantasy influence. So to me, it was just so obvious that, like, yeah, this is how you'd write a magic system. So it was really right. interesting to see that once you kind of got out of your, like, bubble, there'd be people who would look at something that you took for granted and go, that doesn't make any sense. It makes so little sense that I'm going to negatively review you for it. Yeah, that's one of the things we we do have to learn as a new, right, new, new authors is that, the things we take for granted that we know, like when it talks about showing and not telling, like in really building out the world to where it's like anybody who picks up the book is like, oh, I get it. But we don't think about that because yeah. at least I, I know I did didn't think about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes a, it take it takes a lot to to write a book. And so with the with the magic system, you did have and I asked I asked this question a while back um, on Twitter about how many of you have actually written rules for magic. Are there actually rules involved? So this is one of the more loosey-goosey magic systems I've had. I've made a few. Um, but the general idea is that, you know, you're a kid, you'll be magically receptive. They can test this by how you interact with magic. And when you hit an age, about around puberty, you can unlock your magical ability. Uh, most people wait later, uh, depending. But And basically, it could be anything. They have a very elaborate categorization of it. But you could have something like generalized telepathy, which means that you can generally use telepathy. Specialized telepathy might mean that you can um, do something very unique with telepathy that you wouldn't normally be able to do, but you really are only doing that thing. Okay. And basically, um, the system I created, I created a very in-universe system. I tried to make something that was very complicated because the world is very bureaucratic. Uh, so you have generalized and specialized. So, you know, can you just kind of So, like, as an example, real quick. So, like, how yeah. Magneto can move metal and metal yeah. objects is almost you like that a and generalized then, metal controller right but um like phoenix or, or gray what's her name uh jean gray can yeah. pretty much move anything would be oh yeah yeah, yeah they're, they're yes yes so that would be telepathy um but you could also argue that but then again they might say that magneto is specialized telepathy the, right. there's a lot of categories and some of them do overlap i did that on purpose because like i said i wanted a world that had that bureaucratic feel of like it was people creating the system, not like me saying this is how magic works, which, you know, is a gamble. Um, and then you have <laughs> external and internal, which is basically yeah. external as you can affect the world around you and internal as you affect, your, affect yourself. Mm. Um, so you would have some people who are really external, some people are really internal. Uh, so someone who is internal telepathy could probably fly, they could probably like, you know, uh, alter how they move, they could be stronger, but someone with external would be moving objects. 
I got you. Wow, that's really cool. And there are all these types of characters in the book. Yep. Yep. They're just um, running around. Are they just running around in the streets? So, like, how are they interacting with, with so each other? Going back to my desires, um, there's a lot of stories where magic is an oppre- a metaphor for oppression. And I've always liked those stories and despised them at the same time because I always feel like they ignore the very basic fact that you cannot equate marginalized groups to people who shoot, shoot lasers out of their eyes. <laughs> it's very difficult. Yeah. So I wanted to create an oppression metaphor that worked. So what I did is I based it off of uh, service workers, like um, a hospital and firemen, but assumed that they could never take the uniform off. Okay. Um, like there was a story my friend was telling me about how like you had some like firemen who uh, I think after like a tragedy were just eating in a restaurant and people kind of just went up to them and said, why are you eating here? Bad things are happening. You have to go. Yeah. Get to work. And, yeah. And they had just come back from that work. They were very tired and hungry. So I wanted to create a world with that in mind of like these people are always going to have jobs. They are always going to be needed by the state. But in that dynamic lies the problem of like how heavily they're monitored, how heavily they're controlled. And if they have certain affinities, they don't really get a choice in what they get to do. Right. Because they are considered so important that they need to go to certain places. Right. Well, so, yes, yeah, like if Superman was never allowed to take off his cape, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. He still needed to sleep. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. He, wow. Um, and they're also used as kind of um, an upper class, like a, a scapegoat, because it's because they always have jobs and because they're always in work, they're very easy to point to and because they're very prominent as people. Like, warlocks are marked, everyone knows who they are because they need to be like pointed out in a crowd. It's very easy for the upper class to go, hey, these are the guys who are making your lives harder, random normal people. <laughs> so. Okay. I see, I see. Wow, so, okay. So, this book deals with some serious, like, issues then, for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I studied sociology in college, and that's always been a passion of mine, so I very much wanted to take a sociological approach with it, of, like, how the society functions around this world where magical people exist, and, like, what unique power structures and uh, dynamics would uh, arise as a result. I feel like fiction's a great way to answer questions, um of our subconscious mind that yeah. we're always asking ourselves and like we can come up with a question but we create this incredibly like intricate sci- sci-fi or fantasy story to answer this question did did the did what okay first off what was your question if you had one and second what did you answer it or what, uh, so, what did you come to um <laughs> i had a lot of questions because like i said my question is what would young adult uh, genre staples play out in my version was kind of, I was a very meta take. I love reading. So I had a very like book uh, originated approach. Sure. Uh, so I had a few questions. One of them was, what do I think a um, group of magical people would look like in an oppressive society in a way that would make sense? I think it, as opposed to just direct uh, one-to-one parallels, I ended up drawing a lot from different types of marginalized groups. Uh, so for instance, a lot of warlocks are disabled in my uh, story because I think that, um, the way we treat disability is is very uneven and haphazard and very harmful. Yeah. And we often will uplift certain ones while also putting down people in the same breath. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll treat, like, people when they're, like, putting their best face forward as, oh, this is what you should be like, even if that's actually not healthy for them. Yeah. And, you know, they have to constantly put on that normal person face and stuff, depending on, like, what's going on. And I, I drew a lot from that uh, with um, with my characters and stuff. Of, like, they kind of have to put on, like, the face that they can function as a normal human where many have issues. Um, like, if you have ability that lets you think really well and, like, you can deduce, like, how long a distance is to, like, the millimeter, that's great. But you still have a brain that functions around this. You constantly are thinking about that. You can't just turn it off. Right. Uh, and as someone with ADD, that's something I relate to, of, like, the things that give us like, you know, our strengths and make us who we are also kind of make us outcasts from society. Yeah. And they can be seen as weaknesses or things yeah. to put down on. Yeah. So did you, did you answer your question? Did you find what you were looking for through writing this, through writing this book? Or is that why you're continuing the series? Is that well, why this series continues? I don't know if I answered my question, but I learned so much more about it as I wrote. For right. instance, the story I just told you about the workers in the restaurant, I didn't know that story going into this. I didn't know it when I wrote book one. I didn't know it when I published book one. It was when I was editing book two and I was writing this, someone explained it to me. And I was like, that kind of explains a lot of what I've been subconsciously drawing on. 
So I wouldn't know if I answered it, but I definitely learned so much more about the topic just by writing about it. Yeah, it's funny. It's like it's like how math can solve so many different like problems in the universe and in science. <laughs> Writing can solve so many uh, human issues. Yeah, I think like as as we write, we're basically doing like a long form math problem to get more gentle and in touch with humanity as a whole. And yourself. And yeah, and myself absolutely. Like me writing my book was the most life changing experience I had ever had. It completely transformed me the way I thought. Yeah, I definitely had to confront a few of my morals based on my writing. Uh, it was actually really weird. I wrote a, a, I wrote a specific interaction about how like a terrible person should be treated, right? right? And I wrote it, and I didn't think much about it. And then the exact same situation happened in real life. And it was yeah. just that moment of, I have actually literally written what I think the ethical thing to do is here. So to not follow that, even though everyone else will be really confused by this change, would feel like a betrayal of myself. Yeah, that's amazing. So what did you yeah. do? Uh, it was basically the idea that there are terrible people in this world who you never want to interact with again, but they still have to exist. Sure. They can't just stop existing in your bubble. Right. They're going to keep living, and just, even if they're terrible, that doesn't make them criminals. So what right. I realized is that if we are living in a community that might be important to them, as long as like, you know, there is merit in accepting that they have very valid reasons to want to return. They have very valid reasons to want to try and play the game of coming back because they also need socializing. They also need like friends and people. And that seems like a very simple thing to realize, but if someone's been an asshole to you for like months, you're not going to go, yeah, I think I should give you a second chance, especially when you're like, no, get away from me. So yeah. kind of realizing that balance of, I can give you a second chance without ever opening myself up to you. Right. And accepting that was something that I found very uh, interesting. It ended up not going well because the things that made him an asshole meant that he was further an asshole, asshole and stuff happened. But it still resulted in a second chance. And for me, I felt like I, we gave you all the chances we ethically could. Letting the, It's almost like being able to forgive somebody for being human. It's like we're all human, right? Because there's a lot of times, I mean, as writers too, and as just human beings, like I have to forgive myself for screwing up for being a little bit harsher than I, I should have been at times or, or being a little bit too silly when I didn't need to be or saying something too stupid, whatever it was, but where I need to be able to forgive myself because it's important that I forgive myself so I can forgive other people for doing the same thing. And that's because, I mean, that's how we interact in life. I mean, we can't, like you said, we can't just have everybody disappear from earth because we disagree with something that happens, right? Yeah. It's an important thing to learn. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, like I, I still hold merit in the idea of keeping people away who hurt you, but yeah. like there is that idea, there is that balance I find, and it's interesting. It's something that we can't really work, especially with the internet. Of course, the internet doesn't inter exist in my story, but like you know, you have a lot of. There was a lot of moral questions I had to answer for myself just because I decided to write one specific character based on a one note joke I wrote way back in book one. It was very like strange to realize my brain had led me down this very specific pathway. Yeah. Yeah, and you're right. It's like it's not about letting them come back in and be a monster in your life. It's just about you kind of letting go of the control of what they do, right? Yeah. I mean, who cares, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're all monsters at some point. So you you also wrote Heroes of the Sigil. This is the second yeah. book. Yeah. This is out now as well, right? Yes. It's yeah. been out since uh, last August. This August. It's been out since August. This is <laughs> Okay. How's the feedback been on uh, Heroes of the Sigil? So I've had less readers overall, which makes sense. It's the second book. But I've gotten way more positive feedback. Awesome. Um, like I have like a four-star rating uh, for he Warlocks, but I have a five-star rating on Heroes. Um, yeah. And I have less reviews overall, but I definitely have more reviews now on five-star than I did when I first had warlocks like when i got my first four star review it was less than the current amount of reviews i have now for heroes so i clearly am retaining some reader base and the people who i'm retaining seem to enjoy the bullshit that i am selling it's beautiful that's right uh like i even warned my editor so i know what i wrote in warlocks of the sigil was good and people liked it but i'm gonna go in a very different direction for heroes and i'm gonna go in a very different direction for the next book and i'm just gonna kind of keep doing different directions because i like doing that so I'm very glad that people are on board for like my shenanigans. Well, when you say different direction, what do you mean? 
Oh, so I think I grew up reading a lot of books that had a very certain formula in place. Like you have Harry Potter, right? And obviously yeah. every book in Harry Potter was different, but it would start off with Harry Potter was an 11 year old boy and he's going to go to Hogwarts and in yeah. Hogwarts, he's going to do this and this. And then there's going to be some changes to the status quo and stuff like that. But he's still going to hit certain aspects. Right. You know, and you read stuff like Animorphs is another book series I loved. And there was always I that idea. Uh, I, I think my fascination with gore comes from Animorphs because there was such like a unique clinical sterile way of approaching it. And I loved it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but like you could argue that the books did hit a certain formula of like things weren't going to improve. Even if they did and things did change, it was very slowly over the course of time. Right. And for me, I very much wanted to write a book where because things had changed so much, you were basically getting different themes in different contexts, different mm -hmm. in like different settings. Like obviously the cast would be similar, you'd be still be still dealing with the same issues, but I didn't want to just have a like a filler book of character development and a side adventure. I wanted to have a direct continu continuation of the story, where sure. you could not put any like where the events by the end of it were so drastically changed that you could not compare that setting to the ending of book one. Okay, so you you built on it big time. Yeah, on, yeah. On book one, also. Yeah. It's it's fun to, it's it's fun to write a series like that. I would think to have these characters that because you fall you kind of fall in love with your characters, right? And <laughs> yeah, see them grow up and learn. My bit like when you're talking about Harry Potter, my favorite thing was the whole idea of learning magic. And I would get so pissed off when reading these books, and he was like not studying. I was like, bro, <laughs> are you kidding me? You get to I learn like, magic and you're not studying right now? I feel like that could have worked, but they didn't do it right. Because I think one of the main things is that because magic was kind of presented very mundanely of like, yeah, this is just the thing you do. But I feel like there was this level of like, it was still very fantastical. And sure, there were essays based on this stuff, but I would totally learn magical history. So you, I feel like they should have, I feel like J.K. Rowling probably would have worked better if she gave more reasons of like the bureaucratic underlining so oh it turns out you still gotta do paperwork and even when it's magical paperwork it still sucks yeah so i feel yeah, like that was it, a missed opportunity was, there's a lot of them in there i always i always sided so much with hermione though because she was like well i don't know if you've noticed this but uh before the movies came out like this hair was poofy and everyone said i looked like hermione and then emma were... watson casted and no one said it anymore <laughs> you were like damn it <laughs> I had one thing going for me, and it was that I looked like Hermione. From the books, yeah, they took that from you, those monsters. <laughs> she was too pretty. She is pretty. <laughs> so, what are your? So I know what your inspirations are. What, obviously, you, you love playing um, some magic tabletop games. The and larping. Books. And what LARP? Larping. You go outside yeah. and do that stuff. Yup. Yup. Yeah. <laughs> how often do you do that uh once a month that's awesome what do you dress up as usually uh <laughs> so uh in the in the game i go to it's very steampunk uh, victorian colonialist and i dress up as a character called a barca which is uh for that game specifically they are um a muslim inspired like uh grace which i like because i'm muslim myself so I was like yay i get to be a fantasy version and their whole thing <laughs> is that they have magic runes on their face and they, there's a special class that I took where you have a magic sword that is attuned to you, and it lets you cast magic with the sword. And basically, I get to be a Jedi, which is nice. one of my dreams as a child. So, like, I, I have so much fun. And I dress up in all pink. I have a dress, and I act all hyper and cheery, and I fight people with my sword. And that's, so cool. I, that's how I spend a weekend once a month, and it's my favorite thing ever. That sounds amazing. You really immerse yourself in the magic of the world. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, like I recommend tabletopping every that everyone tries tabletopping at least once because it gives you a way to focus on one character. But if I could like get people, I would totally try and convince them to try LARPing at least once because you really get to see a world of just a bunch of people, like 20, 30, sometimes even 100 people, like pretending to be different characters. And it can really like give you a sense of like weight and perspective. And I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very cool. I haven't met any LARPers in real life. I just, <laughs> I just saw the. Um... Role Models, that movie, and I saw uh, Oh, wait, no, Role Models is a good one. Role Models is funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah it uses, it, uh, so it's funny. Uh, role Models uses a very specific system, which uh, most LARPs I go to don't use, but it is common enough that I'm not surprised they used it. But interestingly, the name of the LARP 
that uh, exists in Role Models is the name of a real LARP in New Jersey. And they very often get people showing up expecting the uh, Role Models uh, LARP, even though it's completely different. There. Hmm. Got to have high expectations. No better way to live life than have extremely high expectations of everything. You'll always be satisfied. <laughs> Fact. Speaking of which, what piece of advice would you give somebody just starting out writing? Oh, boy. See, I am always so picky about writing advice. Like, I was the type of person who people would post writing advice, and they're like, um, actually, that's only true in some cases. In other cases, it's actually the wrong advice to give. Writers so are such idiots. We all, <laughs> we are all such arrogant idiots. and such low self-esteem at the same time. It's terrible. Um, yeah. I think the main advice I would give is uh, know what you want to do and figure out why you're not doing it. If you want to write large stories and you can't even fit, write chapter one, figure out if it's more important to you that you write that large story or if you change your goals. Because I think a lot of times people have an idea of what a writer looks like in their head, yeah. but they don't have the uh, desire to actually follow through. Yeah. Um, so they kind of get stuck in these cycles of like, they're gonna have a big seven, like, seven installment book series, but they haven't written yet because they want it to be perfect. And I always say, like, is it more important for you that you write these books when you're 40 years old and it's perfect? Or is it more important that you have books written now? Yeah. And, like, what compromises do you have to make? And that's a very, like, weird, nuanced piece of advice. But definitely going through my writing, I realized that I had to decide of all the things I wanted, what actually was the most important to me and what amongst my other values were stopping it from happening. Yeah, because you, you get down to the fact of discovering who you are through the writing. Like, and if you're, not, if you're not writing, then you're not discovering anything. Yeah, like the reason I ended up self-publishing was because I realized that to me, it was more important that I had books that I worked hard on and I published as opposed to actually having the name recognition. Right. Um, to me, it was more important that I had something out there and that I learned. So I, I went with self-publishing after years of saying I never would. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's great advice, honestly, because, I mean, if you, if you don't know who you are and you're basically writing with somebody else's voice or who you think yeah. you should be. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people I think who really like the idea of being a traditional writer with like the big book series when there's a lot of writing jobs that don't involve that. Like you can go work in the, like, I'm not going to say it's going to pay well, but like there are, there's splat books, which are basically just tabletop world building fodder. And yeah. you don't have to write, a, you can just write world building. And if that's what you like to do, then don't try and write a huge story. If all you want to do is world build, there are so many other options. Yeah, definitely. Then write your passion. That's great yeah. advice. Awesome. Well, Perry Ackman nailed it, right? Turkish. Yeah. Yeah. The Turkish <laughs> wonder. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the Uniweb interview show and talking about your incredible books, Warlocks of the Sigil and Heroes of the Sigil, available on Amazon, right? And you can follow Perry on twitter at oh you should make me remember my own twitter username Ruth. you don't know it i got it i got it i got it i have it <laughs> perry ackman one that's perry a-k-m-a-n one that's at perry ackman one p-e-r-a-k-m-a-n one follow her harass her on twitter tell her to tell you about writing isn't that and, is that right? Yep, and thanks so much for letting me uh, talk your ear off. I can, I can you, keep going for a while. You <laughs> were a pleasure, Perry. Seriously, okay. we we have this group uh, in the writing community um, and on Twitter, and I had no idea that this was your personality. It's it's <laughs> it's fantastic. It's it's one of the issues of uh, advertising myself online. I'm way more restrained online, but once you get me talking in person, I'm just. Woo. It's it's wonderful. Do more of that online. I should try. I gotta figure it out. It's <laughs> you're a writer. Do it. Just because Thank I'm so a much. writer, do you think I know anything about how to do things? That's true. We don't know how to do anything. Like we don't know how to do anything. Can barely make myself food. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's out getting food right now. I don't know how to make food. Well, exactly. I do well, he, theory. theory. We we don't know the basics of life. But we can create worlds and languages and <laughs> magical systems. What, I'm supposed to shower every day? I don't know about that. <laughs> Look, if no one shows up and you're not seeing anyone, no one can judge you. 
That's true. Yeah. No one's around to hear you fall. No one's around to hear you stink or smell you stink. <laughs> <laughs> Do you really stink? I don't know. These are important questions. Maybe we'll get to later. Thank you so much for joining the Uniweb Interview Show, Perry. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. We'll see you on Twitter. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Uniweb Interview Show with me, Matt Whiteside. Please subscribe, like, and uh, also, yeah, hit the notif- the bell thing for the notification. We love you here at Uniweb Productions. Come back and see us. Thanks.